Good morning and welcome to part two of our SEO for e-commerce series uh, with myself, Nathan Lomax, co-founder of Quickfire Digital and our special guest, Mark Williams-Cook from Candor. Morning, Mark. How are you doing? Morning, Nathan. Good, thank you. Thanks for having me back. No problem at all. A great first episode and I know we've got quite a lot of people tuning in today, over 150 people registered to join us this morning. So for those that are new to this format, we try and put these on as frequently as possible. It's a real chance for you to ask those burning questions you've got in this case around SEO for e-commerce. So if you are with us this morning and are joining us live, then please do jump in at any time, ask your questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Now, for those that perhaps have been here before, you'll see that we get through as much as we possibly can. And I've actually got some questions already come in. So I'll start with those. And then as we go through today's session, if you want to ask anything or you're unsure, jump in, get involved uh, and ask Mark and I anything you would like. And so, Mark, without further ado, let's get started. Last time we talked a little bit about uh, SEO uh, across the site, but today we're really going to focus on product pages. And so for e-commerce, product pages are arguably the lifeblood, the lifeblood of a business, let alone a website. So where do you start with SEO in mind when it comes to product pages? Wow. Yeah, there's, lo there's loads of things we could talk about um, for, for product pages. So a few things I think I've seen that catch people out is cat firstly categorization of products. And to give you an example, Let's say we have an e-commerce shop and we sell furniture, right? And we want we have our product page for, I don't know, like basic wooden chair that we're trying to sell, okay? And that might fit into a couple of categories. So we might have, say, like dining room furniture. So that fits in that category. But also it works maybe as, I don't know, like outdoor furniture, okay? So this, this makes perfect sense from a user point of view, it makes perfect sense from like an econ manager point of view. So you go ahead and you put your product, you tick, yeah, it's in both these categories, everything's great. Now, what you've ended up there in a lot of cases is a situation whereby you'll have a have a site and you'll have your site name, you know, marksfurnitureshop.com, whatever, forward slash, and then you have the category names. So the way we've just set it up, we might have, furnitureshop.com forward slash outdoor furniture slash and then our product page wooden chair and then we'll have another url that will be our shop.com forward slash dining room furniture slash our product name so what we've done is we've created essentially two urls for the same identical product um so we, we've caused an issue there in that search engines are going to get confused because if someone does a search for that product page it's like oh well, there's, there's two here or three or even more, which one do I rank? So firstly, having a plan around that. So if you have products that um, do fit into multiple categories, one, the, the most simple solution is something like a platform like Magento do out the box, which is to have URLs that basically don't include the, the category in the slug. So you just have a, you know, shop.com forward slash product forward slash wooden chair. So then you can put it in all the categories you like and you don't have to um, worry about creating duplicate pages. And there's other, uh, that creates itself, like many solutions, other issues around breadcrumbs and stuff, but um, we'll talk about that another time. Um, other things um, are, well, I always bang on about schema, so I'm, I'm not gonna pass up an opportunity to do that. I still see loads of econ sites going live without schema, so schema is that thing to label your data for search engines, there is specific, um, schema that's great for e-commerce sites, so product schema, um, and that will give you the opportunity then when your product pages rank in Google, it will get these extra bits of data that says it's in stock and it's thirty nine ninety nine. Um, so really, really important. Um, there's other benefits to having schema, but that's one of the main ones. And probably fifty percent of the e-com sites that come to us to talk about SDI just have a quick look at their product pages. They don't have schema. Um, and lastly, so I'm just I'm just picking three here because there's many, um, is having a plan around discontinued products. Um, again, most e-commerce businesses we speak to, the ones that have some kind of turnover of product, meaning a product has like a season or it has a shelf life and then it's discontinued, they just delete the product when you know it's discontinued. Because again, that seems like the obvious thing to do for users and, and for the site. And this is where you've got, this is where SEO comes in, right? So we need to make this a friendly thing for for, for 
search engines too. So if you have a product page and it is ranking in Google for something, if you just delete that product page, obviously it's going to be a like a 404 page not found. Search engines are not going to want to rank a broken URL, so it will get dropped and you'll lose whatever traffic you are regularly getting from that. So one of, and this will depend on your situation, but one of the many um, potential kind of ways around this or ways to get maximum opportunity from this is to make a discontinue page to say, okay, so you leave the page title the same and you say this product is discontinued. And then you can actually maybe point them to like the nearest possible product. Like maybe this is the new model of this, for instance, because even if say a model is replaced, you will, if it was a popular product, you will likely still have this hangover of searches happening for that product. And you don't want them to go to a competitor and you're still serving the same intent. You know, maybe I'm looking for this, this printer model, for instance, that you sell. And then you, rather than just not appearing and someone else appearing, you can say, okay, no, it's been discontinued, but here's the new model. So you retain that traffic. So again, lots of different ways to do it. But um, again, a lot of businesses don't have a plan for what to do with discontinued or underlying products. So let's just revisit that a little bit more, Mark. So let's say it's a Christmas promotion and you've got a Christmas uh, category and then Christmas products. Uh, for example, it come January, they're no longer relevant. Then you just change that page, remove the products. But instead of officially removing them, you just say, look, this, these are now out of stock until next Christmas. Please check out our upcoming Easter range or something like that. Yeah, I think I think see, seasonal ones are always interesting. So I've I've had um I've had lots of discussions about product pages, about categories, about even bits of content that are seasonal. And wherever possible, um, it is beneficial to um to keep URLs alive in search engines. So again, you've got that divide of you you could, for instance, um, like you say, remove all the internal links to those seasonal categories um you can no index the pages just to tell search engines in the in the meantime to to actually not show them as search results but that would be certainly more uh, beneficial long term than like deleting a category or making a new one the next year um and again it just comes down to what's again what's going to work for the user you know because it certainly doesn't make sense in you know the middle of june for them to be landing on like christmas offers of course yeah, makes perfect sense. Just a raid who's just asked a question. Yes, this will be recorded and we'll make sure that you've got access to it through the uh, group that we've created. If you're not part of the SEO uh, for e-commerce group um, or events that we've created, get yourself involved. I'll happily send you the link and then you'll see today's recording and also get access to the previous recording and future recordings. And so, Mark, jumping on to the next question here, which is around product descriptions. And this is a topic that's always brought up when we're discussing web builds with people. Is it right to stuff them full of keywords and variants or actually is this something to avoid? And is there an optimum length or an optimum um, presentation for these descriptions? I feel like it's a loaded question. Do we stuff them full <laughs> of keywords? Um, let, let's start with the M1. So the short answer is there's no optim optimal length right for a product description you see you know you see bits of advice floating around saying oh it needs to be 200 words or something right of course there is a correlation between a product description length and generally how well a page ranks so if you try to write all product descriptions in three words versus writing them in 300 words yes you would expect to have the 300 words rank better because it's very difficult to describe a product well in three words. Um, and But that's not because of the length of the content. That's not why it's ranking. It's ranking because it's more helpful and it has the information that people are searching for. So the optimum length is basically the length that it needs to be, if that makes sense, to get the relevant and best possible information across. Um, in terms of actual just length of pages in general, the amount of information, um, I'm always, I've always been a fan of basically as much as possible. So Amazon really were kind of the people that pioneered this. If you zoom out on Amazon product pages to see the total amount 
um, of information they've got in there. They look like almost strips of sellotape because they're so long and they have so much um, information contained in there. Um, and I've heard arguments previously saying, oh, well, you know, we need to we need to keep it short and sharp and kind of, you know, keep people on the we want them to add to the basket. But in every test I've seen, in every user test, in every quantitative test looking at analytics and A-B testing is that the longer, the longer, more detailed pages outperform um, the shorter ones, you know. It's not that people, are, you know, getting distracted like, oh, I've got so caught up reading this detail, I forgot what I was trying to do. It's that the longer content answers the questions, it overcomes objections. Um, and from an SEO point of view, of course, you know, if you start including, you know, take our printer example, details about all the different types of connections it has, or if it's it's a portable printer, what the battery life is, you can then capture information, uh, or sorry, you can capture searches for that specific information. So if someone's searching for, yeah, a portable printer with at least two hours battery life, and you've mentioned that, then there is a chance of you ranking for that. If the information is not there, then of course, you, you won't. And, and lastly, on your first part of the question, which was, you know, do we kind of put loads of keywords and variants in the, I think the question is, why would we use, why would we use variants? And by variants, I mean, like another way of um, writing a search term. And the answer is because not everyone does the same search. Words don't mean the same things to everyone. Um, even native speakers, you know, especially even the UK and different parts of the country use different kind of words for the same thing so <clears throat> as part of the kind of more in-depth content analysis you would look at um, are there meaningful variations about what people are searching for and the second kind of bit of that puzzle is do search engines already understand what those variations are so to give an example, if you have a variation on like a, a type of product, for instance, if you search for them both in Google, sometimes you will get pretty much identical set, a set of results, okay? Um, and that tells you that the search engine understands that the person's looking for the same thing. So then my priority for should I include that kind of keyword variant in my copy or whatever is like low. It, like it doesn't need to be in the page title, for instance. I might mention it somewhere if it if it's if it makes sense to do so. If you have a variant that's so different, or just one of the edge cases where you type both into Google and you get two different sets of results, then that's telling you actually for whatever reason the search engine doesn't really understand they are the same thing. Um, so, for instance, an interesting one I've been working on recently was looking at kind of coach hire and minibus hire, which are kind of the same thing and looking at the overlap of sites that Google ranks between those two search terms. So if they are different enough, then, yes, you need to include those variations. And then you fall back on your keyword data for which has the most searches, maybe if you've got the data, which converts best if you've got PPC data, for instance, as to which one you lead with. So again, it's very much from a, you're balancing the user need versus you're plugging the gaps in the in the technology that exists, um, which is a lot of what SEO is, right? It's just plugging technology gaps that search engines aren't quite as smart as people yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> yet, yeah. But well, I've got a first question come in from our audience today, uh, which references our last session. And for those that have perhaps just joined, just a reminder that we have done one of these before, a slightly different topic, and that's available uh, within our LinkedIn channels, both with, through Mark's channels and my own. Um, but if you can't find it for whatever reason, please reach out. But last session, we did touch upon the big opportunity within image search, particularly for certain types of e-commerce businesses. This is a massive opportunity. What should you be looking at with your product images to stand the best chance of ranking? Again, yeah, there's that's like a whole so there's a whole separate branch of SEO really. It deals with um, images and image search. And one of the things we touched on to frame this for everyone is um, a lot of ecom searches actually start within Google Images, especially things like fashion. So I do it all the time, right? If I want a new pair of like high top trainers, and I decide. I want blue ones or something. I might type something like uh, blue high top trainers into Google, but then rather than try and see which websites are ranking, you go into images, into Google image search, and then you just start 
scrolling through until you see something you like and then you click on it and then you see you know you go to the site where where it is and that's repeated a lot um in ecom because shopping is a visual thing so there is a big benefit to um to making sure your kind of google image uh, game is up there so the basics are um and again as we covered if you can avoid using stock imagery so again, if you look at Google images, you won't see the same image repeated over and over again. And that's because um, you know it wouldn't be helpful to do so. So if you've got stock imagery and a hundred other sites are using it and you're all targeting the same kind of key phrases, it's unlikely that you're gonna rank. Other basics are um, it's more for accessibility, but you've got the opportunity to give alt text um, for an image to describe the, the contents of the the actual image and google um does try and extract information about the subject matter of the image from the content of the page this includes captions image titles so wherever possible you make sure your images are placed near relevant text on pages that are relevant to the image subject matter um url structure is actually one of the um things that impacts image ranking so google uses the url path as well as the file name to help understand the image. And that's a little bit different to kind of web pages, but it's worth considering organizing um, image content so the URLs are kind of constructed logically. Um, schema, again, of course, uh, can't, <laughs> can't answer this without mentioning schema. So Google Images uh, supports product schema, meaning Again, you can, in Google Images, it can start saying like in stock and show that that thing is for sale. Um, again, basics, make sure the images are optimized. So that means they're, they're compressed. So they're small, they're fast to load, they're responsive images. So they work on different devices. And um, if you're doing, if you want to appear in Google Discover, so that for those that haven't um, heard of it, it's part of the kind of Google app. It, it guesses the kind of thing you're going to be interested in next surfaces articles for you. They want very large high res um, images as well for Google Discover. What else? Uh, image sitemaps. So you can actually, apart from a sitemap of your pages, you can actually generate a sitemap of images to make sure Google understands where or finds all your images and kind of can categorize them a bit easier. So you can do um, page sitemaps, video sitemaps, image sitemaps as well. I think that's everything off the top of my head. It's quite it's quite a list. Um, yeah, yeah. I hope everyone's yeah. got a notepad to hand. And Nadim, I'll come to your question very shortly about uh, what makes content useful. But just building on from what we've just talked about, Mark, what about videos? How about product videos? Similar process or actually a whole nother world of, of optimizers? Is there like video schema or is that supported by product schema? Yeah, so I mean a lot of the a lot of the things I just mentioned apply in that you know you want it in relevant places, blah, blah, blah. Yes, absolutely. There is video schema as well that can help describe um, what's inside videos to for for search engines. Um the the main difference i would say is you've you've got to think about youtube as well so you know youtube is one of the largest search engines in the uk um and if someone knows they want video content a lot of the time they will again just go straight to youtube so it's like a whole different channel and then you've got this um you've got this rabbit hole of like youtube seo so how do you make your video rank well in YouTube, which is very different to Google? Um, you mentioned schema again. Yes, um, you, you see the, the searches that will really interest you are the ones that trigger the video results in Google. So this is normally, it's not normally actually product pages unless they contain things like how to. So like how to use products or how, you know, guides. They, you'll see a lot of the time Google will surface videos at the top of the search result. And again, that's indicative of the intent of the user in that Google says, okay, well, I understand that this search is best served with a video result. So obviously if you do not have a video, guess what? You won't rank for it. Um, video as a whole, I would say is nowadays super, super helpful for, for e-commerce anyway from, again, from a user point of view, the technology is still chasing video in my opinion in terms of search we're seeing big leaps so you know you you can upload a video on youtube and it gets automatic captions you will now see if you do a search in google 
and it returns a YouTube video, it has the recommended like places to start in that video to answer your specific question. And that's amazing when you think about it. So Google's like watched the video for you and you've asked a specific question about how do I change the battery in my portable printer? It's like, yeah, three minutes, 20 seconds in this video is where you wanna watch. It doesn't always get it right. And that's a huge task because videos are very big files. They're very heavy to process. Um, so my mind is still mainly on the user when we think about video. Um, but again, from an e-commerce strategy point of view, the cost of making good video now is like rock bottom compared to what it was like 10 years ago. You know, it costs thousands to make good videos. Now, basically everyone can do it with like a plug-in mic and a smartphone. And Mark, just on the video piece, you mentioned about stock images earlier. Is there a way that actually if you've got professionally shot video versus stock video clips from Shutterstock or something like that, again, is there a preference in terms of, okay, it's animation versus video or speaking to camera versus something else? Or actually, as long as it's video, they're all categorized in the same box? Yeah, so I haven't seen any. That, it's really That's a really interesting question, right? Because you see in Google image search, you can filter to things like um drawings or clip art or like real life photos. I haven't seen any of that kind of filtering yet for video. And I've certainly, I've never actually even heard anyone discuss whether different types of video are optimal. I think you can jump a few steps ahead of that and just ask the question, you know, what's the most useful? And that's gonna be the, the, the correct answer. So if you remember, I, I always keep in my mind, you know, these algorithms are following us. We're not following the algorithms, right? The algorithm's trying to understand what is the most helpful thing to a person. So sometimes you can end up with weird answers if you try and turn the mirror back and be like, what is the algorithm telling us is helpful? Certainly you can get feedback back, back loops, which can help guide you in, in, in the detail. Um, but I would, again, just think about, think about the user, okay, we want to do um, case studies with our clients, then, you know, talking heads kind of thing makes makes sense, right? But it certainly wouldn't be worse if it was maybe an animation. So, Mark, let's go to the audience. We've got a couple of questions coming in. I'm going to start with yourself, Nadeem. And just for those that are listening that perhaps have a question, please do just pop it in the comments and I'll do whatever I can to get around to it as quickly as possible. And so Nadeem's asked, what makes content useful? Which is really the, the million dollar question, right? But he actually goes on to say that it, in his opinion, if your content is long, it means it covers lots of good things and that the content is short, irrespective of the content, perhaps it has no meaning or information. I guess... The big question off the back of that is, while we might not be able to say what makes content useful and what doesn't because it might be subjective, what we can say is on those pages, Mark, if you want to include loads of content, what are your thoughts to the kind of read more recordings and things like that where you can actually show quite a condensed product page, but actually for those that do want more information, you can give them that experience as well? Well, firstly, I would respectfully disagree that um, the length of content is related to how helpful it can be. And when we when we do our SEO courses, we've got some great examples of this. So the example I used for years was a search about when do the clocks go back in summer? And the number two ranking site had hundreds of thousands of links you, you clicked and it was a regional newspaper and it had, um, had about 5,000 words. It had a video, it had a poll, it had images of people sleeping, it had the history of clock changes, why we do it. And you really had to dig through to find when the clock changed. The number one ranking site was about three lines and it just said in huge letters, the clocks go back on this date, right? And this poses the question, if your search intent is to find out what, what date the clocks go back, which of these sites would you prefer? You know, and the obvious answer is I want the site with the like one line that just tells me the, the information that I need. Um, you know, it's very easy to churn out long content that basically means nothing, you know, and, you know, while I think you need to be careful about the things Google tells us, because some, they've, they've sometimes phrased things very tactfully, and there's sort of between the lines things, they have been incredibly clear and said that the length of content is not, we don't take that into account. It's, it's not a thing. Of course, there is that correlation normally because if you, you've, I've seen loads of studies that say, look, hey, the stuff that ranks number one is longer in general. And of course, because 
on average, people have spent more time and more effort and more love and thought into that type of content. So the the I think the the actual answer to the question about what makes content useful is is very simple. It's content that answers the intent of the search as quickly as possible. And that I would say that's it. Um, anything else is just fluff. You, you see people complain about recipe sites a lot. There's that running joke that you have to read someone's like life story before they just tell you how many eggs they need, right? And it's annoying. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, you know, I'm definitely a fan on, um, you know, and it's why we're seeing things like featured snippets in Google and why Google gives us instant answers. They're not doing it because people dislike it. They do it because the data shows people like it. Um, to get onto your addition to that question, which is about the kind of view more, hide more, click tabs. Um, again, that's a really interesting question because Google's advice on that has actually changed. So the advice used to be that if you hide things behind tabs, um, we will take that as a hint that it can't be that important because you've hidden it from immediate view. However, now we are definitely waist deep in a mobile first world. Screens are smaller, real estate is important. I think Amazon's a really good example for this, right? So rather than hide a whole section away in a tab, um, Amazon will do something like they list the technical specification and they will list maybe what they know are the five or six most important bits, bits of information about this product. And then they just have like a view more like link that then will expand that if you need it. From a technical point of view, all of that content is always visible to search engines at all times. Um, but it does help. It balances, again, that user experience of, yes, we want all of the content on the page, um, but it's not particularly helpful to, um, to sometimes have huge bits you have to scroll through. So things like jump to links can help. Jump to links can help Google as well. Um, get you to the right place in the page from the search. Um, so that's something we've seen Google doing recently, which is you do a search and when you click on the result in Chrome, it jumps you to the correct part in the page and it highlights the text you need in Chrome as well. So again, um, I, would, I would tend to avoid putting things if possible behind entire tabs because um, it, it just makes things less scannable. Um, and the last kind of UX principle that I tend to think about is because lots of devices we're not using a mouse we're swiping is that scrolling a scrolling action on a mouse as well really is a little bit less friction than a clicking action especially on mobile where you have to be a bit more accurate it's easier just to quickly scroll past something than open up tabs um but yeah, so there's no real issue anymore with if you do need to hide bits, as long as there's the caveat of as long as you do it in a way that search engines can still read what's behind whatever you're hiding. Um, and it's certainly now, I'd say, common best practice when we're dealing with mobile first pages. Mark, we're up against it here with plenty of questions coming in. And thank you all so much for, for asking your questions. I promise I'll get around to as many as we possibly can. Uh, Mark, coming back to you with Alexis's question, uh, is there a limitation range for the sum of keywords to be used per image? Thank you in advance. Um, I think of it like spreading butter on your toast <laughs> in that you've only got so much, uh, like uh, Google's only gonna pay attention to so much data that you put in. So if, if you listed, for instance, every single word in the, in, in the English dictionary, you know, on an image description, that makes no sense, right? And there's gonna be a certain amount of importance placed on kind of each keyword that you use. So if you just start using thousands, it's gonna be spread very thinly, okay? So I would focus on the things that are most descriptive. So if you're doing, if you're using an image, I would I would just say, can you, can you describe what's in that image without someone seeing it? Um, you know, would, I, I, you know, and especially with things like alt text, you just wanna use, you know, language to describe the image you don't just want to list words so if you has you know a um picture of a black labrador in a sunny field that is similar to what i would use as the alt text i wouldn't write things like you know dog comma black comma labrador 
I would actually just just describe it that way because that's more helpful from an accessibility point of view. Again, caveat, if you are writing alt text, don't write photo of, image of, anything like that. Screen readers do that for you. Thank you. And Alexis, I hope that helps. Do come back if there's anything else you'd like to ask on top of that. Same with yourself, Nadim. Coming to yourself, Rupam, who's asked, how do I deal with out of stock items? <laughs> Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, getting them back in stock would be the first answer. <laughs> um, so the this is a bit of a trap because if you say, um, if you have on your actual product page this item's out of stock or if you use schema to say it's out of stock, um, Google will try not to rank that page if there is another page on the web with the same product that's got it in stock. And of course, that makes sense, right, to, to the user. Why would you want to be sent to a page where something's out of stock when you can go somewhere where it's in stock? So I have seen um, certain e-commerce retailers be very sneaky, like they will never use the term out of stock. They will kind of explain that it's, um, that, you know, they'll do things like email on availability, for instance. Um, so firstly, um, that's always something I would do with out of stock. If you know you're getting it back in, give an estimated date when it's going to go back in, offer an email to um, ping ping the customer when you've got it back in stock. Um, if it is a product that's um, stocked in lots of other places, you know, you're always going to be up against it because if people can go somewhere in two clicks and get what they want straight away, it's unlikely they're going to wait. Um, there are exceptions. You know, if you're selling one of a kind or unique things that aren't available elsewhere. It kind of doesn't matter if they're out of stock because nobody else is going to rank anyway. Um, so I was kind of, you know, while it was kind of a joke of get it back in stock, that's, you know, that's really, you know, the answer. It's, it's basically you have to accept that if you're saying it's out of stock, that Google's probably not going to want to rank you. Um, or you can try and get around it by being creative with the wording. And you also have to drop the, so part of product schema, is what's called offer um, and that describes things like if it's in stock now the offer part of product schema is not compulsory meaning i have all what the other thing you need to do if you want to be sneaky is if something's out of stock you actually don't deliver the offer schema anymore so you're describing the product but you're just kind of uh, not bothering to mention the small detail as to whether it's in stock or not. Um, I think, to be honest, that's a bit hacky. And I think Google will, um, I don't think they'll penalize people for it, but they will work out what people are doing there. Um, so it's got a limited shelf life. So if, if that's going to be a huge amount of like development work for you, um, I'd say it's probably money better spent elsewhere. Mark, thank you. Stanley, I'm coming to you next. And we touched upon this a little bit earlier, but he's talking about discontinued products. What are your thoughts about redirecting them to their respective category pages? My impression is that they should be redirected to another page with similar content as much as possible, but it's fine to delete the page as a last resort if it isn't getting any traffic or ranking well, and there are no suitable alternative pages to redirect to. Yeah, so um, I'll share it with you after this, uh, after this, Nathan. I actually did... Um, quite, I think it's quite a nice flow chart for discontinued products for SEO. Um, again, it, it, it's, it's one I've tried to make generic because different, you know, different sites will have different requirements. But the general kind of flow is yes. So if a product is discontinued, my first question is, you know, is, um, is there a kind of close product that you'd want to send people to? And if the answer is yes, then I would keep that page, say it's discontinued, and then say, you know, you want to go over here now, right? S keeping with that, what's likely going to happen over the months is that the search volume for that discontinued product is going to drop off and people will start searching for the new product. When that happens, I would then actually do a 301 redirect from the old discontinued product to the new one so i set an arbitrary time it was like three months or something that i would generally do that um, because of course you don't want your site littered over the years with hundreds of discontinued pages again doesn't really make sense um, and of course you need to remove internal links to them but that's the that would be the the situation there the next step is okay we've discontinued a product um there is no real kind of 
one for one match for this product, right? Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky and you have to just use common sense because this depends like, okay, is there still like a matching category intent for that product or not? How many searches are we getting for that for that product? Um, if there is that matching intent, um, then again, I would, if you've got searches for that page, I would still normally put a discontinued page up for a little bit just to, again, have that good user experience of you've looked for this we don't sell it anymore go look at this category okay again after a certain amount of time i would then 301 it to the category level most likely and then the final step is okay we've discontinued product and we've discontinued that whole category there's nothing relevant anymore then it would come down to, okay, does this URL basically have any links to it? Does it have any other websites kind of citating it? If so, I would try and find somewhere to redirect that to because links are kind of the lifeblood still of, of ranking and you don't want to get rid of them if you can avoid it. If it has no links or anything kind of worthwhile, then again, first step would be discontinued page, explain to the customer why it's not there. And then I would do a uh, a 410 instead of 404, which there's a, there's a small difference. Search engines kind of treat them the same, but 404 is obviously page not found. So you've asked this URL, it doesn't exist. 410 is the server saying this page is gone, as in it's been intentionally removed. We know, chill, don't bother coming back. It's not coming back. So they're the kind of three main, like I've done a flow chart from I said I would work through. Again, obviously there will be exceptions for different types of businesses and um different situations that's roughly the what i'd follow so yes um question there was correct in that there are absolutely cases where you would just cut it off and not redirect there are cases where you do category redirects and there are cases when you'd leave discontinued up thank you mark and stanley i hope that's helpful francisco coming to you next he says i'm sorry mark a bit out of scope here but why for some websites on search console does he still get the desktop crawler as the main one instead of the mobile one seeing as we're in a mobile first world. Uh, not sure if you know anything about that. Yeah, because uh, Google haven't got around to doing mobile first crawls everywhere yet because the web is very big, um, basically is the answer. So they had their original um, goal, I think it was like March, I think it was March a year ago that they were gonna have everyone mobile first crawling. And yeah, they a few people questioned this and Google was just kind of, yeah, we're getting around to it. The internet's really big, bear with us. Um, so, you know, again, no reason not to be uh, optimizing for mobile first. It's just, it will change. Um, but yeah, it's not rare. I've, I've, I still see that on some of our sites that we look after. No problem at all. And Akash, coming to you next. Um, top three points, Mark, when it comes to optimizing videos uh, for being indexed and ranked, ranked in Google. Uh, yeah, if you were to choose three things that you should do from today, what would they be? Hmm. um it's a good question so just just the basics really so schema video site maps and um think about the actual video title so the absolute basics um again if you want if you're really getting into video then you need to start looking into youtube and kind of in, that then you're looking more at engagement metrics than than anything else um and if you're going to do video just please do it well um so audio is the thing that captures most people out on video like it costs about 100 150 pounds to get a very nice mic that will sound decent you know there's nothing more painful than watching someone that is just recording off their phone five meters away um it's horrible <laughs> <laughs> And Sushant has put a piece in here around um, Amazon has lots of currently not available pages, but they still rank for many keywords. Guessing, Mark, they've adopted one of the tactics that you mentioned earlier uh, in terms of, yeah, just not quite updating the schema or, or something like that to get around this. I mean, I, I just wouldn't compare anything to Amazon. You know, that there's just nothing useful that's going to come from that. Amazon is like an edge case. They're an absolute monolith of the web and um, there's a million things that's going to cloud any type of analysis you do from them from an seo point of view you know apart from the fact that kind of everyone knows who they are they've got this huge brand presence they've got millions of pages they've got millions of affiliates um you know i think it's useful to look at <clears throat> the 
kind of best practice in terms of what they're doing on their pages um, for users because they spend a lot of money and they have a lot of systems to to do that research for you. But in terms of why are they ranking, why are they not, you know, the answer is shrug. It's it's Amazon. You know, you're never going to be able to have the same be play in that environment that they're in. So if <clears throat> I would actually try and look at people that are kind of nearer your competitors and maybe why are they ranking, why are they not, um, you know, and it, yeah, I mean, I can go on for, for so many reasons why Amazon is different um, to other sites. Um, That's fine. Thank you. Let's come to you, Nelton. What are the best practices for menu navigation? How does it impact if a menu has 100 links in it from the drop down menus and different categories and subcategories versus, versus perhaps five or six? Yeah, it's a, that's a really interesting question. So, again, you've got this uh, mirror between um, the again user and search engine. So the internal linking for SEO is really important, and internal linking is talking about how so you link your own pages together. Now, <clears throat> what algorithms like PageRank are describing is essentially how important specific pages on the web are based on how many other pages they're linked to and how many pages those pages are linked to themselves. So, you know, if you created a whole new internet just with 100 pages and none of them are linked together, they all have the same kind of base amount, tiny amount of page rank. And when you start interlinking them, that's when it starts kind of gooping up in various places. So how this, how this impacts you from a menu navigation point of view is that Essentially, any page that is linked to from your main menu is, by definition, linked to on every page on your site, where that main menu is at least, which is normally all of them, right? So any page that's linked in that main menu, from a user point of view, it seems very obvious, is obviously very easily discoverable and is, uh, well, yeah, we'll leave it there as easily discoverable. From a search engine point of view, that reflects through page rank and what you're basically saying is that any page that's linked to on the main menu is a very important page because it's it's linked to from lots of pages and those pages it's linked to from are linked internally lots as well so you need to reflect this um in your planning of your link architecture which is okay these are competitive categories or subcategories um we want lots of people going there this is a these are sensible start kind of places then they probably want to be in your in your main menu um personally and this is a personal preference i am quite a fan of similar um actually to to give you an example from a user point of view from like amazon use those mega menus they're pretty big right i personally like them um <clears throat> from a from a user experience point of view then having that menu instantly it's like a mini contextual site map tells you okay they sell all these categories of products i've got some useful information there they do or don't sell what i need from a search point of view you're getting that perfectly optimized anchor text links from important pages to all of those so if possible i try and have that approach like slightly flatter rather than having to click to a category then click to a sub category and then in you know if, if things getting really horrible a sub sub category you know you, you really want to avoid that um so so yeah it does have a big impact on seo um you definitely need to have what you're doing tempered by someone who uh, you know and this isn't me someone who knows a lot about kind of ui and user experience and has kind of a design side so that's why you know we've we work with designers internally when we do this kind of thing so they can help us with best practice. But yes, yeah, definitely uh, a bit, one of the biggest things you can, you have control of is your internal linking. Thank you, Mark. You must be saying something all right because we're getting so many questions. I'm struggling to get through them, but let's come to Matt and next who said, how should he choose the best product for certain keywords to rank? Uh, is there any process you would go through to say, okay, this is my product and out of the 10 keywords, this is the one I'm going to choose. Sorry, is the question there? The question was choose the best product for yeah, the keywords how did you choose or choose the, the, best, or choose the product. best keywords for the product? Best product for the keywords. Okay. So best product for the keywords. So that would be, I think, almost on its head there. So if I had a product, so I wouldn't be looking at keywords and then trying to find really a product to match. Um, I would be looking at the product and then trying to research what people are calling that. And the reason is, even if you manage to rank for 
keywords you've chosen for your product, unless they are actually really what people are searching for, you've got that mismatch of intent, which is then your conversion rate will be lower. Google will eventually work out, oh, this isn't the right kind of thing. So if you've got the product, how do you find out, um, how do you do keyword research basically? So firstly, you've got your internal language that you use to describe that product. Secondly, um, ask your customers, right? What do they, what do they call this? What is this thing? What would you search for? And you know, this is literally the first step. Just before you use any tools, just ask people, ask random people if they're kind of relevant, ask or ask your kind of focused people that are your customers. Like if you were looking for this product, what would you search for? Um, that will give you your kind of sort of seed phrases. Then you can start using things like, um, you know, the Google Keyword Planner at a first step, which will give you um basic things like search volume for those so obviously if there's a clear winner in search volume that's where i would start my exploration you don't necessarily always want to go with the highest volume if you've got budget if you've got ppc campaigns running i would again that's a real great place to get data from just bid on those key phrases spend a couple of hundred quid and then see which ones actually convert. So, okay, this one um only has half the amount of searches but it converts at three times the rate of the one with more searches so it might be you want to focus for that one first or it may be that everyone is piling on to this big search term and this happens a lot right people do keyword research they pick the one with the highest number and then everyone optimizes for that sometimes you just pick the second one down and you realize that you're then that's got 80 percent of the searches but you've only got 20 percent of the competitors because everyone's just opted for that one with the highest search so that can be a real good in to very quickly get sales um then you want to go start going down um the line of using tools like um answer the public and our tool um it's down for maintenance at the moment but it'll be up later this month also asked.com then you can start gathering questions that people are asking around these kind of products. Um, so that's things you want to include maybe in like FAQ sections on your product page and capturing the long tail search. Um, and then branching off from that, you've got normally a whole load of things you can produce about, again, like how do you use your product? How do you maintain the product? Comparisons to other products. Again, coming back to what do people need to know when they buy this? What are they considering? What's their intent? So the actual keyword selection for the product is, you know, there's a process there. It's fairly straightforward. It shouldn't take ages. But then as you branch out into the, all the intent that surrounds products, that's, again, it's more effort, but that's where you can get a lot of, um, a lot of value from SEO. You can get a lot of traffic because you're doing things other people aren't bothering. It's a way to get links um, and it's a way to gain trust if you're actually showing you know, you're, you're the person that's actually providing that value as well as just selling them the thing. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Coming to the next one from Rahul that says, do you recommend optimizing for an e-commerce site with affiliate keywords such as best niche products or top niche products reviews 2021? In his point of view, you only sell products from your brand, but keen to see your thoughts on that. Um, so, yeah, we, in the e-commerce space, you obviously got the merchants who are, you know, people who own the e-commerce sites or own the, the brand, the products that are selling. And then you do have this affiliate space, which are trying to rank in Google by producing extra uh, additional value. So they are the um, non-bias comparison between brands, between products, independent reviews. Um, personally, I don't think Econ brands should try and do that themselves because you know everyone knows that you you are not non-biased you want people to buy your products so it's a little bit sort of silly being like okay here's you know mark's furniture store here's our fair comparison to our rubbish competitor and their flimsy <laughs> chairs that they sell it's just not going to work um it should still play part of your seo strategy though in that um so for instance i've worked i've worked in the electronics niche um selling tvs online and apart from optimizing the site one of the things we were doing was looking at searches for people doing things like you know what's the best flat screen widescreen curved whatever tv and you'll see certain websites that rank and they're these independent maybe affiliate sites that review them 
And all you have to do is actually get in touch with them and just be like, we're from such and such brand. We think our product's great, of course. Can you include this in your next roundup you do or whatever it is? So you can still have um, be mentioned on those pages. You can still get links from them. Um, and actually, I think it's better for you and the consumer to see you on these independent sites. And again, even if you get a shoddy review, you've got some, some good product feedback to go on. Um, so yeah, I would personally avoid, um, you know, there's better things for you to focus on than doing that affiliate kind of stuff. Thank you, Mark. Guys, about 10 minutes to go. Please keep your questions coming in. I can see I've got two or three more rounds to get to, and I'll try and answer them all before the end of today's show. The bit I love about the series that we're doing together, Mark, is that we're getting guests from all over the world. It's not just all from sunny Norwich. They're, they're dialing in from right. all over. So thank you all for, for getting so involved. Rupa, I'll come to you next. You asked a cracking question earlier and looks like another good one here. He says, suppose I have to use product description content direct from the manufacturer's but the content is not unique for my website as they would be repeated across multiple websites. Obviously, Google doesn't like duplicate content. So what do you do for large e-commerce sites in that case when actually you've almost got your hands tied by this is our content that we have to use for our product and you're reselling it on their behalf? Yeah, if I mean, I've never seen a situation where you're not allowed to like add to that. There might be a situation whereby specific, you have to sort of mention specific things, um, but you know if we if we play along and say okay hypothetically um, we have to use this boilerplate content for product description, then I would look at you know the most important on page elements things like the page title, seeing if we can describe the product slightly differently, um, or actually look at this kind of supplemental content strategy. I mean, the, the most common thing that I actually encounter with that is just sites with like thousands of products and you've just got the feed and everyone imports kind of the descriptions and then we're stuck with the task of, okay, well, who wants to rewrite 10,000 product descriptions? And it's like, you know, tumbleweed, nobody wants to do that. Um, there, are, there are actually lots of um, kind of tools you can use now, like uh, copy.ai is one um, that can kind of give you a good head start in um, writing um, content kind of descriptions. Um, and that's something I'd look at if you're trying to do it on scale. Um, otherwise, I'd just triage and look at the most popular products and, and kind of start there and, and just work work my way through. Um, but yeah, I've, I've certainly never encountered a case where you're not allowed to kind of add additional information to the products. And that's where I'd go with that. Um, because you're absolutely right. If you just got an identical carbon copy page with the same images, it's not that you'll be penalized, but Google will filter the results and just pick kind of one. Thank you. I'm going to come to Devran next, who uh, looks like you've got a fan over in Sydney, Mark. Um, she says, I can't wait to use alsoasked.com uh, when it's back, but would you recommend adding product reviews into product pages? Is it beneficial in terms of ranking? So it depends, it depends, I guess, on the, 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 the content. I would say <clears throat> I would always include product reviews on product pages is, is the short answer, yes. Um, yet it might be that people are asking questions or not asking questions or leaving comments that, again, match up with the types of search people are doing. <clears throat> you've, got, um, you've got product review schema as well um, that can help. Google has loads of really interesting patents around trying to work out sentiment around brands and and things entities on the web having a patent obviously doesn't mean that they are actively using them um but i just can't see any downside to doing that um you know again unless the reviews are bad in which case the problem isn't that you are including the reviews on the page it's that you you know your product sucks and you need to fix it um or some, something's wrong so um yeah i would I would always do that again look at you know look at amazon it's one of the first things that that people look at as well if you if you run something like hotjar um on product pages when you when people know you've got reviews there it's kind of like you know the process for a lot of people is okay this is the this is the correct thing that matches what i need it's the correct price now i scroll down to see if it's any good or not because i'm just going to read some user reviews okay i'm satisfied with that i'll go for it Final question for today, Mark, is around the importance of voice search. For those looking to embrace voice search, where should they start? 
yeah voice search that's an interesting one i heard people saying that by 2020 half the search is happening we're going to be by voice um so i think for you know voice search for me it kind of isn't quite as exciting yet as i think some people are making out so there's a lot of um searches happening that are functional like what is the weather tomorrow and you know set my alarm and how many feet in a meter that kind of stuff when it actually comes to people doing like transactional searches the the most we see is them or the most common thing we see is them actually just using their voice to type the search query in um rather than actually use really any kind of assistance um it is coming so last week google announced um that their google duplex now is going live for supported restaurants so if i don't know if people did see this i imagine they they did because it was kind of viral in may 2019 we saw google demonstrate um their their duplex technology which is their uh, thing they use with google assistant i don't know if you saw this uh, nathan where they were trying to book a hairdresser's appointment and then the google ai phones up and just has a has an actual conversation with the shop did you see this no this is okay mega. i have to okay i have to share this with you yeah, so this yeah this is so this is really big right so google have this tech called duplex it's like this assistant and you say you know go book me a uh, two seats at you know this restaurant and it will in the background phone up and have this conversation saying you know i'd like to have a reservation for for two people at 7 p.m and then they might go oh, we haven't got 7 p.m and the, the ai is like okay well, what time do you have and they're like we've got 8 30 and they're like that's fine and it has a full-on conversation right so that tech combined with um the latest announcement a couple of weeks ago was google's releasing this uh system uh, well set of systems that they're broadly calling uh, mum which means that when you do a complex query now and by complex query i mean maybe um, the example they gave is if say you had hiked up uh, mount fuji and then you were going to do a different mountain and you want to know the difference and usually you'd have to do several searches this technology kind of predicts what the several kind of bits of information you need are and it doesn't just give you a web page it gets the information from the websites and then using text similar to gpt3 it just writes you an answer it basically produces you like a, a web custom web page on the fly that's got exactly what you need on right so that that means that you know if you asked a mountaineering expert what's the difference between these mountains they would know okay well i need to tell them about the shoes and the, the rainy season is a different time of year so that's the kind of thing it's doing and it will just tell you so we've got those two massive bits of technology which are just inching over the line i think in a few years once they are over that line that's when voice search is going to become exciting right because then you can actually conversationally say you know what do i what do i need to you know it's 35 degrees outside what do i need to go running and google will be like okay well, hat sun protection camelback these types of shoes that are particularly airy kind of thing that's when voice search becomes exciting for me the tech is still pretty basic when you watch people use voice search it's kind of frustrating they're shouting at the thing because it's getting words wrong it's just not the slick thing you see on star trek right um so there's nothing particular you need to do for voice search except i'm going to say again schema 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 that's the key to all of this stuff is schema right the key to google being able to use this tech the key to us being able to use it as consumers isn't search engines reading web pages and heuristically working out what's going on it's about people providing structured data that they can put into a graph of edges and nodes and it understands what's related to what and then the ai can move around that so the short answer is schema <laughs> but the the backup answer is that in my opinion there's not a lot that's going on you're not going to like double your sales because you did a voice kind of thing but that in my opinion is coming and web search will be in the bin in several years' time. Sruthi, I will um, just say, if you look at the last recording and you look at today's recording, hopefully that'll answer your questions about where to start with SEO for newly created e-commerce businesses. 
I'm conscious that we're coming towards the end of today's session, and I just want to finish by suggesting that everyone that's enjoyed today, please do like, share, engage with the post, tell others, get others along. We had 100 to 150 people along today. We're already looking at about 200 to 250 for the next one, which is on the 30th of June. That's nine till 10, where we'll be taking a or tackling another big topic within the world of e-commerce and SEO. Um, but finally, it's just left for me to have a massive or to say a massive thank you to Mark, who once again has given up his time this morning to share his wisdom. And there seems to be nothing that this bloke doesn't know when it comes to SEO <laughs> and e-commerce. So please do uh, join us for the next one. Mark, just very quickly, if people want to know more about you or Candor, how can they find out more? Yeah, so I'm pretty active on uh, LinkedIn. So just Mark Williams Siphon Cook, post tips every day on there. Um, I run a podcast every week called Search with Kanda. So if you just search for Search with Kanda, you'll be able to find it. So that's like 20, 30 minutes every week talking about PPC and SEO. And if you're interested in working with us, just search for Kanda Agency. Hopefully we'll be top. <laughs> um, and you can see what we do in, in the realms of uh, search. But always happy to talk to anyone kind of about SEO or, or search in general. Mark, as always, thank you for your generosity and your time. Great to catch up. I hope you've all enjoyed it today. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again on the 30th. And until then, uh, best of luck and keep in touch. Thank you.